And because he's a different kind of king, Satan, Satan, Satan can take advantage of that to our own detriment. We see that in John the Baptist. John the Baptist was filled with the Spirit in his mother's womb, we are told. When he heard Mary speak, he, he leaped in his mother's womb. But now we see a different John the Baptist. Herod, the pathetic man that tried to kill Jesus when he was but a baby, a pathetic individual. Herod had thrown him into prison. And prisons, prisons were different kinds of places than what they are now. They, they were not the well-lit, climate-controlled prisons of our day. They were dark, dark dungeons of squalor and, and human filth. And prisoners didn't have rights. In our day and age, prisoners have more rights than the guards who guard them. In John the Baptist's day, it was a total different story. Oftentimes, the guards, simply out of a devilish delight, they would strip their prisoners, and then they would wrap little threads of, of leather on their hands and wrists, and then they would, they would force them to hold up their hands, and they would tie them to a rafter above them. And then they would do the same thing with their feet to do different posts, and so there they were, spread eagle, naked as a jaybird. And then they would begin to beat them and fill their hearts with pain and suffering. In the midst of their pain and suffering, and, and, and this of John the Baptist's pain and suffering, he began to doubt. He began to doubt whether Jesus was the king that he needed. He wanted a king that would come storming in there and, and set him free from those who were torturing him. And so he sends his disciples with this question, are you he or should we look for another? This was not the kind of king that John the Baptist wanted when he was in the prison. Satan takes advantage of that. He, Satan takes advantage of the pain we experience too. Let, let pain wrap its arms around you. And you may try to see a different Jesus, too. James Hennington was a missionary to Africa in the 1800s, 1885. In October of 1885, October 29th to be exact, he made a notation in his diary. And he said this. I have been suffering from exceedingly high fevers. So much so that most of the time I'm delirious. I hate the night. At night, rats the size of cats come out and they bite on me. I am feeling low. I'm broken. In the midst of pain, when pain wraps its arms around you, we begin to question whether or not God really loves us. Does he really know our situation? Just like John the Baptist did. Alexander Solinskin. Is that how you pronounce his name? He was that great philosopher, you know, Alexander Solinskin. Harold knows how to pronounce it. He wrote later on in, in his uh, works that he was sent to a, a Soviet prison in Siberia. Hard labor, terrible conditions, he said, inhumane treatment by the guards, and constant, continually being forced to hard labor. He said there came a time when I hoped for death. I wanted to die. And I was going to throw down my, my shovel, and I knew that when I did that, the guards would kill me. And I was prepared to do that when another prisoner, he quick made a, a sign of the cross in the dirt. And it dropped me out of it. In the times of suffering, we wonder whether or not Jesus is really the right person for us. And maybe the worst is when our sins torment us. Our mind is set, set at a maddening pace. 
This happened to Martin Luther. Luther was tormented by his sins. He was tortured himself. Pain in the mental aspect is, is worse, isn't it, than the physical pain. And Luther would later on write, I'm afraid that God will hold against me on the last day that I blasphemed him. I blasphemed him. When as I was in my cell, I said it was bad enough, Lord, that you sent Moses to and gave us commandments, which we couldn't keep. But it was even worse that you sent your son to give us even greater commandments, which we can never keep. He would later write, I blaspheme God. When your conscience condemns you, torments you day and night, as it did Luther, we, we, we may well begin to question whether or not Jesus is really the kind of king that we need. Satan takes advantage of that. He takes advantage of our suffering and isolation and all the misery we go through. Man in his, in his infinite wisdom can, can be exceedingly cruel to his fellow man. Are you he or should we look for another? Jesus is a different kind of king. He died. For his people. People don't die for him per se, but this king dies for his people. He was brutally beaten. He was mocked and ridiculed from little on up. Even his mother and his brothers came and said that he was, he was crazy when he was in one particular house. Who objected to that? Who rose up in indignation when they, when they so mistreated Jesus? Who told them that they were doing it all wrong? Who said that they were wrong when they were crucifying him? No one came to, to Jesus' aid. Or, and even worse than that, his own father turned on him and punished him severely. He experienced hell on the cross. I came not to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. He took our place on the cross. God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. God placed upon him the sins of the whole world. By his stripes, we are healed. This is indeed a, a, a different king. This is a king that comes to, to save his people. He purchased for us forgiveness of our sins. Where there, where, where there is sin, where there is sin there, his love and forgiveness is even greater than our sin. If you ever wonder whether God loves you, whether Jesus really is the right one, then realize, look to the cross. He gave his entire life for you. He loves you more than he did his own life. He loves you with his whole heart. This is a different king. This king came to, to save us, to offer up a sacrifice. Only he could do it. Only he was good enough, perfect enough to offer up the acceptable sacrifice for the payment of your sins and mine. He who knew no sin became sin for us. This is a different king. And as it is a different king, so it's a different kingdom. This is indeed a strange kingdom that, that he is. A, it's not a very impressive kingdom. We think of kingdoms and rulers. Why we, we expect pomp and, 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 and all kinds of events that go with the pomp. You try and go and see the president today and see how close you get to him. This king and his kingdom is a different kingdom. This kingdom, this kingdom is in the entire world. It doesn't make any difference whether you're black or white, red or yellow. This king came for you. 
His kingdom is for you. He brings you into his kingdom by the preaching of forgiveness of sins. The remarkable thing is that this kingdom, this kingdom is established by God himself. He raises the dead in this kingdom. You too, Paul writes, were dead in your transgressions and sins. You too were blind because of your sins. You too were an enemy of God. But then Christ came. And he calls us by the gospel into his kingdom. He forgives us our sins. It's the forgiveness of our sins that raises the dead. It brings new life into us. Opened our eyes who we who were blind now see who Jesus really is. He is our Savior. He is coming to save us from our sins. We see now a God who loves us. A God who forgives us. Other religions don't see that kind of God. Well, think of Muslim religion. How do they get to heaven? Well, by blowing themselves up and, 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 and other people with them, don't they? And what's waiting for them? 72 virgins. Now, you can't get much more carnal than that. But Christ's kingdom, his love and forgiveness it, it moves into us, and we become a new creation. You become alive in Christ, the Paul says. He breathes in you the breath of hope in the world of hopelessness. When I die, I want to die knowing a Savior, a King, who came to save me from my sins. That's what I want to hear. His forgiveness gives us comfort and courage to face death, our death. A young chaplain walked into the army or the feud hospital during the Korean War, Korean War. And it was at night, and soldiers in, injured during the battle were brought in and he began to make his way from one, one cot to the next cot. And he came to this young Marine. His, his belly had been blown open, and you could see that his intestines. And the chaplain said to him, Son, can I do anything for you? And the Marine's response was, No. I'm okay. Chaplain said that he, he went away marveled. Here he was, blown apart. And he says, no, I'm okay. He wasn't worried about it. He said, I, I went on and see the other people, the under, injured soldiers, and so then I went back trying to see this guy this Marine one more time, and when I got there the second time, he was dead. And then I noticed in his now cold and bloody hand, he held a New Testament. And he said, I looked at it, I picked it up, and, and that testament was opened by, uh, to a particular verse, John chapter 14, he said where Jesus says, my peace I give you, not as the world gives peace. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. That's the peace I want when I die. That peace, that confidence, that courage comes only from Jesus Christ. He died and rose again so that you, in facing your death, might have the assurance that, that your sins are forgiven, that, that heaven is your home. And this Jesus, a different king and different king, he feeds us. If you ever wonder whether or not you really should go to church Sunday to Sunday, whether you really should make use of the Lord's Supper, well, surely God knows what is best for us. 
He's given us the third commandment, doesn't he? Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy for a purpose, for our good, not his. He gives us the Lord's Supper where he offers and conveys to us the forgiveness of sins, the very body that hung on the cross, the very blood that was shed from the cross. Why? So that you might have the assurance your sins are forgiven. And when your sins are forgiven, then you have eternal life. You have eternal life. Amen. And now may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and minds in true faith unto life everlasting. Amen. We pray. Oh Lord Jesus, you are the King of kings and Lord of lords. All power in heaven and earth has been given unto you. We thank you for your first coming. You came to save us from our sins. You came to die for them. And you did do that. And your resurrection is our proof that our sins are forgiven, that we have eternal life, that your word is true. And so we pray, may we give us the strength evermore to follow you, to live for you. For we ask this in your precious name. Amen. And Heavenly Father, we pray for Richard Sumter as he is battling his last days here on earth. Give him the strength to hold fast to you as his one and only Savior. Give him the strength to endure and comfort his family in this time of sorrow and sadness and death. 
that in you we have life eternal. All who believe in you have eternal life. We pray for our shut-ins and sick, uh, those who are on their bed of illness and suffering. We pray sustain them and comfort them with the assurance that you do love them and that you have promised to work everything out for their good. We ask your blessing upon our Advent services, which we begin this Wednesday night. That we may, O oh Lord, take the opportunity to hear and study and meditate upon your word. That we might be strengthened in our faith and trust in you. We pray for our armed forces. That you would continue to bring, keep them in your protective care. And bring them back home to their loved ones. Bless the president and members of Congress with wisdom to establish fair and just war, r- laws. And we pray also, Lord, that you may continue to sustain us in the one true faith. Bless the uh, construction of our new building. Keep everybody that works there from harm and danger. These whatsoever things you would have us to ask of thee, O God, grant unto us for the sake of the bitter sufferings and death of Jesus Christ, your only Son, our Lord and Savior, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is truly meet, right, and salutary that we should at all times and all places give thanks unto the O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord whose way John the Baptist prepared, proclaiming him the Messiah, the very Lamb of God, and calling sinners to repentance, that they may escape from the wrath to be revealed when he comes again the second day in glory and power. Therefore, with angels and all archangels, all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying... Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take ye, this is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same manner also he took the cup. And when he had supped and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Take drink, this cup is the New Testament in my blood which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as oft as he drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you. <laughs> 